approaches on external cytoskeletal components of neuron. I don't think I am qualified enough to talk more details, so I will let this try to carry on from here. Uh, thanks, moderator, and uh, thanks, Shatiaji, for inviting me in today's session. Uh, uh, it's an honor to uh, give uh, a talk. Just a second, uh, Isad. Uh, yeah. I do have to linear T because I'm just logging in from my uh, Bangladesh, so I cannot actually for this uh, session. So if you have any <laughs> recording tool or if anyone else have recording tool, um, uh, or you can uh, Let me see who is the host. Hi. Okay, I have to be yeah, host. I, I don't see anyone. Uh, it's showing me I have to yeah, be so the I host. Actually attended the... Yeah, so I was actually the host, but somehow I cannot log in through my Northwestern ID. So, okay. Uh, uh, can Moinu do it? Uh, it's so claiming host. Uh, it, uh, I will just enter the host key to claim host role. Host key is six to ten digit number. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Give me, give me one or two minutes. I can. Okay. I think I can fix it. Uh, okay, sorry for the problem. Shaktajit, is everything fine? 
ওকে স্যার আমরা দুইজন করছি সো সমস্যা নাই আমরা ওবিএস দিয়ে করছি আই থিং দেন উই ক্যান গো এহেড সো ইসাক ইউ ক্যান গো এহেড সরি ফর দ্য ইন্টারাপ্ট এন্ড প্রবলেম অল রাইট थैंक यू सो मच फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी इन दिस सेमिनार এন্ড দ্য টাইটেল ফর টুডেস ওয়েবিনার दैट आई हैव सेड इज काइंड ऑफ जनरलाइज्ड बिकॉज as far as shatuji told me that it's just about sharing ideas uh about how to solve this kind of problems using this kind of tools uh meaning how to solve biophysical problems with computational mechanics that's why i'm not uh i'm not going into so much detail of the mathematics and everything but i'd like to uh give an idea to the general audience on how to use this computational mechanics kind of tools and uh, specifically computational tools uh, to solve biomolecular systems or biophysical problems which are very relevant to real life research problems my specific approach would be uh, to kind of uh, taking an atom to visualize such kind of problem so let's go ahead the slide is changing right uh yeah yeah okay so uh as uh shuho has introduced me my work was on uh computational characterization of axonal cytoskeletal components it's full of so many terminologies uh, of multidisciplinary expertise but uh, let me break it down uh, in brain we know that there are uh, more than 20 billions of neurons and each neuron uh, contains an axon Uh, a rod shaped axon uh, you know what we have read in uh, probably high school biology books that a neuron contains a soma that is a cell body uh, some dendrites uh, which look like tree branches and an axon that uh, creates the link between one neuron and another neuron so that axon itself uh, it consists of some uh, sub axonal components Th those are essentially proteins and uh, these proteins are structurally different uh, for example as you can see in this table that protein can be ordered partially disordered and intrinsically disordered meaning that they can have a very fixed or conserved structure or a part of the structure can be disordered meaning they can be very flexible they don't have any uh, uh, any specific structure and so, uh, and sometimes the entire structure can be disordered what do i mean by that uh, you can imagine an ordered structure uh, as a dry packet of instant noodle it's very hard it has a definite shape but when it's disordered you can uh, imagine uh, as boiling spaghetti uh, in a bowl uh, so that it's very flexible and it can move around and uh, in, from these images you can see that proteins can be of different structures and now when it comes to axon 
there are different types of subaxonal components. Uh, namely, there are four major components, microtubules, microfilaments, neurofilaments, and tau protein. You can see that uh, microtubules and microfilaments are very structured. We don't have to worry about their structure. Neurofilament has a disordered portion in its structure. Some portion is structured and the rest is disordered. And the tau protein, which is actually a cross link between different microtubule bundles, this is intrinsically disordered protein. Now, if we want to solve a biophysical problem in terms of a brain problem, we have to uh, find out what is a critical problem in terms of brain injury or brain neurodegeneration. And when we try to analyze those problems, we have to know these kind of definitions. What are in those uh, 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 sub-exonal components and what are their structures and how they behave. And that's why when uh, we try to solve a problem uh, relating to brain injury, we have to know that there is a length scale hierarchy in brain. For example, if you uh, hit someone on the head, you can uh, immediately see or may not see, depending on the uh, extent of the injury, that that person is injured in the head. You are talking about macro scale. But if you, uh, uh, if you know about the anisotropy and length scale of the brain uh, mechanical properties, uh, mechanical properties of the uh, components of brain, you can see that the propagation of injury and extent of injury is different at different length scale. For example, in a uh, macro scale, the injury will be different. At tissue scale, the injury will be different. And when you go into a very, very small length scale, for example, in nanometer, uh, you are in the axon level, and you can see the microtubule, neurofilament, and tau protein, those will also behave differently according to the extent uh, of the damage. And that's why uh, I'm actually at the very bottom of this uh, uh, hierarchy at, at, very, at nanometer level. So uh, during my PhD work, I have actually uh, analyzed how uh, they mechanically deform. This, this type of microtubule, neurofilament, and tau protein, how do they deform when somebody is injured in the head? So uh, you are taking the, uh, the, the injury conditions from the macro scale, and you are trying to imitate uh, computationally by using different tools, atomistic simulation tools, what happens at the cytoskeleton levels. And when you can determine the mechanical properties of the cytoskeletal components, you can scale up, you can apply those properties to model the single axon, and then can uh, scale up even more. You can go to the ne network level and then track level. And uh, when you are scaling up, at, at, at some time you are no longer in the atomistic level, you will be in the continuum level and you will be uh, doing a multi-scale kind of modeling. Uh, here is like another visualization. Uh, when there is a head injury, there will be a tissue level injury, but it will be different because tissue level injury uh, will be uh, characterized by how the acceleration and deceleration happens due to the macro scale injury. And due to that, many things happen at the neuron level. For example, uh, there are so many interactions between the subaxonal components and those interactions will be hampered. Uh, when someone is injured. For example, there will be some uh, biochemical interactions uh, that, uh, that is triggered by the injury that will happen. Some uh, post-translational modifications will happen. For, ex uh, for example, the structure will be altered in terms of interaction. Some interactions will be, uh, will be hampered so that the uh, molecular integrity will be hampered. So you can see that even a macroscale event can significantly affect a neuron level uh, phenomenon. And uh, that's why uh, when we try to solve an, uh, a brain injury problem, we have to know the uh, major components of the axons and their mechanical structure, their interaction, and associated biophysical and biochemical components. We're talking about biophysical and biochemical components because at the end of the day, these are materials, but these are also biological components. They have not only uh, properties as a material, 
they also have biological functions and they interact uh, with, the, uh, with the environment according to the physical, uh, physical rules. And these are highly uh, altered by the chemical phenomena uh, according to their circumstances. That's why there are so many things and so many parameters associated with them. Whenever you are seeing a mechanical deformation in a microtubule or tau protein, you also have to consider what is their uh, surroundings, meaning what, uh, what is their physics, and also what kind of chemical phenomenon are affected by this kind of injury, uh, meaning you are also incorporating chemistry here. That's why uh, when it comes to a biophysical problem, there are mechanical, chemical, and physical, uh, physical components uh, you are talking about. Now, let's say we have a simple hypothesis uh, that, uh, that is, uh, you are a brain scientist, you are trying to address a research problem regarding brain disease. Uh, say you want to address a brain disease, uh, you want to cure a brain disease, and you want to use computational mechanics to solve a, a brain disease problem. That is, you want to find out how brain disease propagates or how we can uh, solve by using computational mechanics. Now, uh, what kind of specific research questions those can be? Let's say a person is injured in the head. Uh, uh, we can ask what happens at the nanoscale? What kind of interactions are being hindered? And uh, what kind of structural changes are occurring? Uh, and uh, how can you uh, determine the damage threshold or injury threshold? And uh, can we actually successfully or meaningfully uh, simulate the deformation of, uh, of the individual components? Can we scale up these problems to continuum level? And uh, can we, at the end of the day, we want to cure the damage. So what can we do to stop the damage propagation? How can we heal the brain? Uh, how can we uh, trigger the healing mechanism of the brain? So there are so many questions you can ask. Some of these are already answered. You have to find uh, which questions are not answered so that you can be the connecting dot uh, to solve uh, possibly a high scale research question five years down the line. And let's say we are trying to address a very specific brain, uh, brain disease, specific uh, kind of brain disease like Alzheimer's disease of, uh, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, we can see the visualization of what happens at macro scale when a normal brain is affected by those kind of uh, diseases. Uh, just a disclaimer, this kind of uh, disorders or diseases uh, can take place uh, when uh, due to many different reasons, not only injury, but it can also happen to uh, happen due to aging. That is when a person becomes old, the uh, uh, mechanism of brain degradation uh, starts to take place and uh, they lost their memory uh, due to volume loss in, uh, in several brain spaces and that, that sort of stuff. But a lot of the time, this is also associated with uh, uh, brain injury. For example, uh, an Alzheimer disease case that can be worsened uh, in, a, in, a, in an injured person. So there's a difference between uh, a non-injured Alzheimer's disease person and an injured Alzheimer's disease person. And so, uh, uh, and similarly, that goes for CTE also. And how do we know that uh, this kind of injury is propagating uh, in these uh, diseased brains? There are several kinds of biomarkers like uh, loss of brain volume or loss of gyri and salsi and uh, losing of brain integration, that, that sort of things. And you can also characterize this kind of injuries in nanoscale. For example, you will see uh, that uh, several proteins related to disease, these are deposited in different parts of brains, which will tell you as a doctor or a neuroscientist that this brain is no longer healthy, there is something happening. For example, let's say we, we're taking a very specific example. This is uh, entirely hypothetical. I'm uh, using the most known uh, proteins so that uh, many people can relate. Let's say uh, uh, we have a hypothesis that when someone is injured, a pathology 
or a disease propagates. Why? Because when someone is injured, uh, a, 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 a very specific injury-related protein, amyloid beta, that aggregates. Aggregates means uh, that it, 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 it starts to deposit in different parts of the brain so that uh, uh, if, it goes, uh, below, uh, if it goes beyond the threshold value, we can say that there is a fibrillar aggregation amyloid beta, beta is happening and uh, it, it's forming beta sheets. And when this is happening, we can say that the brain is uh, getting affected. It, it, it's uh, getting a disease. And we have several hypotheses on how to, uh, how to uh, remedy this situation. We can propose that possibly if we get this amyloid beta to interact with something, something called X, uh, something, another protein, possibly this beta formation will break because uh, in most of the cases uh, the, in these biological components, their functionality are interaction dependent. When they interact with a specific kind of protein or an enzyme or something like that, uh, something kind of a trigger, they, uh, their functionalities or behaviors will change. Uh, that is, these will uh, act as a switch. So we can hypothesize, uh, let's say, based on the existing literature, that if we get these amyloid beta sheets to interact with glutamate, uh, I'm using glutamate because it's the most abundant protein in the uh, brain. Let's say if, if it interacts with amyloid beta, these beta sheet formations will break. And when beta sheet formations will break, the disease is no longer there. Uh, the cause of the disease uh, is remedied. So it goes to the uh, healthy form of brain. So that's our working hypothesis for now, let's say that someone is injured and you, uh, this person is taken to the hospital. You are seeing that uh, in different parts of the brain, he has uh, amyloid beta sheet formation. And uh, you are trying to uh, see if we try to interact uh, amyloid beta with glutamate, this beta sheet formation will be inhibited and that's how he will be cured. So that is a very uh, large scale problem, but the key step is to see the amyloid beta glutamate interaction. You, you don't know yet what will happen if these two in, will interact. So that's why you have to simulate. Let's say you have several computational tools at your disposal so that you, will, you want to simulate these interaction, amyloid beta and glutamate interaction. So the first step uh, to see this interaction is molecular docking. Why molecular docking? First of all, it's very small. Uh, you are in nanoscale. And uh, these two are protein. So you can actually use protein-protein interaction. And there are several servers that you can use. Uh, there are several manual uh, algorithms or codes that you can use to simulate uh, their uh, interactions. Let's say uh, uh, here the big uh, protein is the amyloid beta and the small protein is the glutamate. Uh, for, for this purpose, we can say that this is a ligand which will uh, come and interact with the amyloid beta. We want to see how it interacts uh, with amyloid beta structure. So uh, let's say we are going to some docking servers. Uh, some popular docking servers are PatchDock and FireDock or ClusPro. You can also use Haddock or you can use GramX. Uh, you can use Rosetta. And sometimes they, uh, they allow you some flexibility in terms of this uh, kind of designing uh, on how you want to see them interact. You, uh, sometimes you can uh, determine their uh, binding affinity, binding energies, and also like favorable docking positions. So you can see that when two proteins interact, they don't interact by random. You cannot like get to interact them as you wish. They will interact in terms of physical and chemical, uh, physical and chemical favorability, or more generally energy favorability. You can see that in a protein structure, it's actually an amino acid sequence. Some of these are acidic, some of these are not acidic. Some of these are uh, electrostatically uh, positive or negative. They have charge, they have charged portions. 
and they, these are there are hydrophobicity and hydro and hydrophilic interactions uh, that you have to take into consideration so when you get two proteins close towards one another to interact they will interact following different criteria for example an hyd a hydrophobic uh, region will interact in a way that is different from uh, a portion that is not hydrophobic or an electrostatically positive portion will attract an electronegative portion of another protein and that's how they will interact sometimes uh, they will also follow induced fit mechanism like uh, a lock and key kind of mechanism uh, you can see that you cannot enter uh, you cannot insert a key into a lock uh, in any way you wish. You have to align the key with the lock. And that's how uh, you get to interact a protein with another protein. So these kind of servers actually use uh, different algorithms to uh, uh, facilitate you using these kind of principles of protein-protein interaction. Now, if you submit the structures of amyloid beta and glutamate into these servers, or your uh, software like Rosetta, you will get some posed structures, like a combined structures, amyloid, beta, glutamate, combined structures. How many? 10, 100, or 1,000. And you can refine them based on energy favorability. Uh, for example, uh, in patch doc, when you submit, you, you will get like a 1,000 structures that can energetically happen. But you refine them by sending them to fire doc and take only top 10 because uh, in terms of uh, computational simulation you want to minimize uh, the use of your uh, usage of resources and you want to be reasonable in terms of uh, simulation so let's say you are proceeding with 10 combined structures that is some docked poses and then you go to molecular dynamics you want to see their dynamic behavior this kind of docked poses initial poses these are your initial uh, t equals t equals zero position to see their interaction and then in a molecular dynamic simulation environment you can see their interaction whether this system is stable uh, whether these are interacting how they're interacting is this uh, interaction very uh, very rigid are they uh, attracting each other very well or is it momentary like uh, is it like inter uh, is it is amyloid beta interacting with glutamate for just a few picoseconds and then glutamate is going away uh, so it will get an indication that it, they don't they do not like each other and other kind of energetical change like uh, let's say the entire system collapses when you when, when you are running molecular dynamics or you are seeing a very specific kind of attraction or change of interaction that that sort of things are your observables when you are running a molecular dynamic simulation so uh, let's say uh, you are getting two different observations, very specific. I'm very, uh, getting very specific to show you like how uh, we would like to address these kind of research questions. Let's say uh, you have a control um, uh, in all kind of experiments or computations. There is always a control, meaning that there is nothing here, only your default system to, uh, so that you can compare it with other non-control uh, observations. Let's say you are running a molecular dynamic simulation or amyloid beta only. Okay, so uh, you have run it for 100 nanoseconds and you are uh, uh, seeing RMSD value, that is root mean squared deviation. Uh, in simpler terms, it's like how much did the protein move? Uh, it, it actually shows you the uh, a quantification of the stability of the system. Let's say, in, uh, in only amyloid beta system, there is no glutamate there, only amyloid beta system, you are seeing that it's very unstable. Amyloid beta is very unstable. It's uh, moving 20 angstrom here and there. So you can see that this system is very unstable. But when you added glutamate with your system, let's, uh, you have 10 docked poses of amyloid beta and glutamate, and you have run it for 100 nanoseconds, and you can see that it, it it has suddenly become very stable. It's not moving at all. It's just one angstrom. Uh, the RMSD value is one angstrom. It, it's meaning that this, when it's combined with glutamate, it's become very stable. And uh, you have actually uh, applying, uh, you have applied 
uh, many other scientific principles, like you are doing it repeatedly so that uh, you can make sure that uh, it's not just by chance, but you can repeat and reproduce the result. You are running it for uh, sufficient time so that you are in a reasonable range in terms of time scale. And you are also checking the molecular dynamics simulation parameters, like uh, whether your force field is valid for this kind of systems. Uh, what is force field? I will uh, come into later, uh, later portion uh, of this presentation. So let's say uh, from these observations, uh, you can actually uh, take a decision. Let's say that uh, first you hypothesize that if we get amyloid beta to interact with glutamate, this will be uh, uh, this will be like breaking up amyloid beta. Instead, it's actually stabilizing the amyloid beta system. So you can say that your initial hypothesis was wrong. Uh, you were very wrong your uh, initial hypothesis. So you will uh, you should actually remove glutamate for your from your system uh, so that the amyloid beta system cannot uh, cannot propagate uh, your its fibrillar conformation cannot propagate. So that's a very uh, simplified way to see or interpret the results of molecular dynamics. And when it comes to molecular dynamics, I should clarify some of the uh, uh, terminologies uh, related to molecular dynamics. There are several platforms in which run this kind of simulations. For example, uh, Yasara, LAMPS, NAMD, or GROMAX. These are packages. When, when we uh, say to someone that I'm running molecular dynamics, essentially, we're implying that we're using one of these kind of packages. There are several others. I'm just mentioning here the most popular ones. And what are inside those packages? There are possibly a graphical user interface or, or there may not be there. There might be only command line prompt or coding, uh, coding platform. And there are essentially force fields. And what do I mean by force fields? Uh, I'm coming into that. Uh, that's a very uh, crucial part of molecular dynamics. And uh, when, when I'm talking about molecular dynamics packages, what is inside there? In molecular dynamics simulation, this is actually a screenshot from a, uh, from a notepad file that I generally use when I uh, mentor uh, molecular dynamics simulation or when I uh, teach this kind of things, I prefer to use Notepad because uh, of the simplicity of it. Uh, when it comes to uh, different packages for, uh, let's say, Yasara, LAMPS, or NAMD, there are different things. For example, in LAMPS, you have a structure file, the protein that you want to simulate. You have to make a structure file for that. And you have to make an input file uh, in terms of commands, uh, in in the in that input file, you have some uh, some kind of commands regarding this structure. What do you want to do with that structure? For example, uh, for this amyloid beta and glutamate structure, you would uh, you will possibly be using some kind of interactions. So you want to equilibrate it, uh, equilibrate it for a long long time. For example, one hundred nanosecond. And as an output, you get a dump file uh, where you can see the trajectories and everything. So similarly, in other packages, uh, you have these three things, structure, comments, and output. Uh, you know, wh when you are using an NAMD file, uh, when you are using the uh, NAMD package, in, uh, in structure, you are using a PDB file. In terms of commands, you are using a configuration. and as and as output, you will see trajectory, meaning the uh, velocities and coordinates and other things that you want to see uh, as an output. Uh, when it comes to Yasara, it's also kind of the same. So uh, in the input file, you generally uh, set these kind of things, the structure information, the simulation box size, the environment. Environment setting is very crucial, like how you would like to uh, how you would like the protein to interact with the environment and what's your time step and what's the duration. So that kind of things uh, you actually uh, set 
uh, in a molecular dynamics package, and then you run your simulation, and then you analyze your data from the damp file or the trajectory file, whatever the output is. And I have repeatedly said about the force fields. Uh, when, when it comes to a protein structure, you have to actually define two different things. One is that what is in that structure, a protein structure uh, in a general sense, it's a sequence of amino acids, but if you break it down, it's actually a combination of atoms. So let's say 100 or 1000 atoms. And how does it become a structure? By the interaction between, uh, by the interaction between the atoms. For example, uh, let's say uh, if we consider a body, our head is connected to the body, uh, connected to the, rest, re to the rest of the body through our neck. And it's only a very fixed orientation. Our hand is connected to our body uh, with, a, with a different orientation. It has an elbow that has a ball kind of joint. Uh, we have shoulder that interacts differently. So similarly, in, in a structure, a protein structure, let's say in one amino acid, there are uh, 20 atoms, let's say. And these 20 atoms are actually connected to each other uh, with different orientations. Uh, they have bonds, they have angles with each other, they have out of plane angles, that is dihedral angles with them. So that is their bonded parameters. There are also non-bonded parameters. They have also some other uh, properties like where they're situated. Uh, are they close enough uh, to form an attraction or repulsion? And or what, what charge do they have? Positive, negative or neutral? So in a structure, a protein structure, when you are uh, preparing it for an MD simulation, you have to actually define these kind of things uh, in terms of a functional form. At that functional form of energy, that is called a force field. And it's, uh, uh, where does this force field come from? Uh, how do I know that I can define the bonds and angles and dihedrals and the uh, improper's, Uri Bradley, non-bonded interactions, uh, like uh, electrostatic and van der Waals interactions, like this. How do I know that this, this is correct? This actually comes from uh, experimental parameterization these, uh, uh, these come from empirical observations. And uh, from when we run an experiment of these kind of proteins, we can actually extract their bond angle dihedral information or these kind of uh, parameters. And we can actually parameterize them in terms of computational force fields. And so that when we try to simulate a behavior, a mechanical behavior or biophysical behavior or chemical behavior uh, through our force fields, we try to capture their energy properties in terms of their bonds and angles and dihedrals and non-bonded interactions. We actually define them in terms of uh, empirical observations. And that's how the force fields are developed. Uh, very popular, uh, Examples of protein system simulations are Charm, Amber, Gromos, or Martini. Uh, you can, you can uh, look into those uh, functional forms of these force fields, and you can uh, see that there, there are similarities, but some tweaks and turns in terms of the functional forms, because uh, the research is ongoing on how to uh, eff efficiently and realistically capture their behavior so that it will be similar in computation as we see in experiments. So at the end of the day, uh, when we are trying to simulate uh, these kind of biomechanical or chemomechanical problem, uh, we end up with some questions like, uh, oh, when it is an injured brain, we know that how the injury is, uh, what kind of strain rate or stress strain that occurs uh, at the subaxonal components or like amyloid beta and how does it affect the amyloid beta glutamate interaction for example if we want to see how uh, it is affecting amyloid beta glutamate interaction how do we quantify this we will compare possibly we'll compare two uh, two 
different amyloid beta glutamate interaction systems. In one system, there will be no injury. And in another system, there will be injury. For example, we will apply a velocity field to this interaction to see if any kind of mechanical injury in these uh, nanoscale length uh, affects this kind of interaction. And we can, we can relate it to our observation, like amyloid beta glutamate interaction does this, it, stab uh, it stabilizes the system and the injury, uh, does, it, does it better to them or uh, whether it worsens it. So that's how we can quantify the deformation by using computational mechanics principles. You can actually apply a force to a biomolecular system uh, by, uh, by using the classical mechanics principles. And that's how the computational mechanics comes into play uh, when, uh, to determine the mechanical properties or to solve a biomechanical problem. Uh, here I have used some uh, stock photos of steered molecular dynamics. It's showing that uh, one person is actually pulling away a protein from uh, another uh, from another protein, and the others are holding it. This is uh, kind of happens when you are trying to simulate a protein-protein interaction. We first we see whether a two-protein system is stable. And then when it's stable enough, we try to apply uh, uh, a deformation to the field uh, so that we can know that what is their separation stretch? Are these, uh, are these interactions strong enough or that sort of things? And then when we get the uh, insight at the nanoscale level, we can actually scale up uh, like, uh, uh, as we have, as I have said at the beginning of my uh, presentation, uh, that when we scale up enough, it it no longer stays at an atomistic problem. Uh, it becomes a continuum problem. For example, we get the insight of the mechanical properties of the subexonal components. Then you can scale up. We can apply it to model the whole exon. And then we get uh, when we get the property of the whole exon, we can scale up again. We can uh, model the exon network. And when we get the property of the exon model again, we can scale up. And then, uh, and slowly but surely we can, uh, considering the computational resource and other uh, constraints, we can ac actually scale up to the continuum problem. And then we can essentially characterize a head model uh, a, head, a head injury problem where you have actually realistically defined a very high definition continuum model of a brain. So uh, that's how this problem goes down the line. And this is, this is called a bottom up approach. You are uh, starting at the very uh, nanometer, uh, nanometer level, and then you are scaling up to solve a head level problem. So uh, that's how, uh, and also you are uh, like getting novel insights on how brain injury or brain uh, degradation is uh, related to these kind of uh, sub exonal level interactions. So, uh, and what are, uh, what are our observables? Like uh, I'm talking repeatedly about properties, but what do we actually see uh, when we apply any deformation to these kind of uh, small scale problems? We can, uh, firstly, there, uh, I have said that it's a very multidisciplinary problem. Uh, there are biological, mechanical, and uh, chemical components. So we see the chemical stability. And in terms of mechanical property, we can see force displacement or stress strain. And also we can say, uh, also we can see strain rate dependence. When it, when it comes to injury uh, in a biomolecular system, uh, sometimes there is strain rate dependence. Uh, if you uh, pull a protein from another protein at a, a very slowly, it may show remarkable resilience. But if you pull very fast, it may fail very, uh, it, it may also fail very fast. And also uh, we can see separation criteria and that sort of things. Uh, in terms of stability, sometimes we see, uh, sometimes we equilibrate it for a very long time and we try to see whether we see some uh, interesting interactions or whether uh, 
is uh, this RMSD values is zigzagging or not, and that sort of things. Uh, and uh, the the simulation box essentially contains uh, solvating liquid. So we see also the uh, interaction of the protein with the water, uh, which quantifies the stability. So uh, this is uh, so at the end of the day, we go back to the problem we started with. In the injury, uh, we start uh, with a hypothesis that possibly uh, this kind of injury biomarker called amyloid beta, if we uh, get to interact with it, uh, uh, if we get to uh, see an interaction with amyloid beta with glutamate, possibly amyloid beta will break. In our case, it didn't happen. It happened uh, totally the opposite thing. It actually stabilized the amyloid beta. So the first hypothesis failed. We will proceed with another hypothesis. Possibly we'll test another protein to interact with amyloid beta to see what can actually break it down so that we can restore or heal our brain. So that, that's how. Uh, so this is one aspect of seeing a bio, biophysical problem. Uh, in here, we have actually uh, seen the interaction criteria. There will be, uh, there can be other approaches uh, to this uh, to this kind of problem, like mechanical property. What is the mechanical property of amyloid beta? Uh, some some people might uh, work on it. What is the damage threshold? What kind of mechanical deformation we have to apply to damage it physically? And what is the mechanism of it in terms of chemical interaction? We have actually captured it here. Uh, what is the uh, what is the damage mechanism? in terms of chemical interaction. And also sometimes uh, the uh, problems are actually in the methodology. Sometimes uh, you can see the problem as an attempt to uh, validate your force field. Uh, whether, you have, uh, whether you are designing a force field and it's not uh, uh, working realistically for this kind of system. So you can actually tweak some parameters in your force field. And that's how you can develop and come up with a a modified or entirely new force field. So there are so many scopes of working here. Uh, you can uh, actually see this problem as a mechanical engineer. And also you can see the problem as a structural biologist. You can see this problem as a force field developer. So uh, you can see that uh, it's a very much multidisciplinary problem to say. And uh, that's how uh, we actually address these kind of problems and uh, down the line, five to 10 years, there is always a large objective uh, in mind. Uh, just to simulate the system is not our objective. It's, uh, it's a transition or a step to the uh, ultimate goal that is curing a brain disease or addressing a biophysical problem, so to say. So I hope that uh, without going into uh, any uh, mathematical or rigorous formulation. Uh, I have been, uh, I think I have been able to uh, show you how to approach a real life research problem and how to incorporate uh, your atomistic simulation tools and how to uh, scientifically interpret your results. I hope I, uh, I have been clear in terms of terminologies and explanation and visualization. Thank you. Thank you, Shankai, for the detailed presentation. Um, we will start taking questions from the audience now. Um, anyone have any questions, you can type it in or just unmute yourself and ask away. Is there anyone? Hmm. Go ahead. I mean, Bangladesh ke kothi English se kuchh na ekta ke difficult ho gaya na chhono. Sure, sure. Acha. Ekhane bhaiya jay udhar tar ki dilam sheeta hotse dui ta protein er molecular docking er matho me tadhe. Interaction is stable, or unstable, and it is possible to have a combination of the 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 
এখন এই জিনিসটা যখন আমরা রিয়েল লাইফে अप्लाई করব তখন জিনিসটা একটু রিস্কি হয়ে যায় কি না কারণ হচ্ছে আমরা কি আসলে পসিবলি জানতে পারছি যে আমরা যখন একটা গ্লুটামেটটা যখন এটার সাথে বন্ডিং করাব তখন কোন মলিকুলার ডকিং পজিশনে এটা কি ইন্টারঅ্যাক্ট করছে এখানে কি কোনো মানে এখানে যদি অন্য কোন একটা মলিকুলার ডকিং পজিশনে যদি ইন্টারঅ্যাক্ট করে সেই ক্ষেত্রে জিনিসটা তো মানে আমরা ধরা যাক দেখলাম যে একটা কন্ডিশনের জন্য স্টেবল হলো কিন্তু রিয়েল লাইফে যখন अप्लाई করলাম তখন দেখা গেল যে আর একটা পজিশনে ইন্টারঅ্যাকশন হলো এবং জিনিসটা আনস্টেবল হয়ে গেল এরকম কোনো পসিবিলিটি থাকে কি না কারণ আমরা মানে এর সাথে প্রোবাবিলিটির কোনো সম্পর্ক আছে কি না এটা জানতে চাচ্ছি আমি আচ্ছা এটা খুবই গুড কোশ্চেন কারণ হচ্ছে আমি আসলে যেভাবে প্রবলেমটাকে উপস্থাপন করলাম সেটা হচ্ছে লাইক কাইন্ড অফ চেরি পিকিং ইউ আর টেকিং এ প্রবলেম অ্যান্ড ইউ আর গেটিং আ সলিউশন অ্যান্ড দেন প্রসিডিং উইথ ইট রিয়েল লাইফে এটা কিভাবে ঘটে এটা অ্যাকচুয়ালি আমরা বলতে পারি একটা ড্রাগ ডেভেলপমেন্টের ভেরি ইনিশিয়াল স্টেজ ঠিক আছে আমরা মনে করি যে আমরা নিউ নিউরো ডিজেনারেশনকে অ্যাড্রেস করার জন্য আমরা হচ্ছে শুরুতে এই কম্পিউটেশনাল স্টাডিটা করলাম যে আমরা একটা মলিকুলার ডকিং করলাম অ্যামাইলয়েড বেটার সাথে গ্লুটামেটের একটা ইন্টারেকশন দেখলাম এবং পসিবল দশটা পেলাম ঠিক আছে এখন কোশ্চেনটা খুবই স্বাভাবিক আসতে পারে যে আসলে দশটাই যে হবে এরকম তো আসলে কথা নেই এর চেয়ে অনেক রকম ভাবেও অনেক রকম ভিন্ন ভাবেও হতে পারে সেটা আমরা কেন এই পসিবিলিটিটা আমরা বাদ দিয়ে চলে যাচ্ছি কিনা এটা রিস্কি হচ্ছে হচ্ছে কিনা ইন টার্মস অফ ইন্ডাস্ট্রি পারসপেকটিভ সো ইট ক্যান হ্যাপেন সো এই প্রবলেমগুলো অ্যাড্রেস করার জন্য যেটা করা হয় সেটা হচ্ছে বেশ কিছু ক্রস চেক করা হয় একটা হচ্ছে যে আমরা যেই সার্ভারের মাধ্যমে এই ইন্টারেকশনটা করলাম সেই সার্ভারটা আসলে এই টাইপের এই টাইপের সিস্টেমের জন্য ভ্যালিড কিনা সেটা অবশ্যই আমাদেরকে লিটারেচার থেকে ভেরিফাই করতে হয় এবং আমরা যেই ইন্টারেকশনগুলো পেলাম সেই ইন্টারেকশনগুলোর থেকে আমাদের নিতে হয় যত বেশি সম্ভব স্যাম্পল সাইজ যত বড় সম্ভব স্যাম্পল সাইজ নিতে হয় যেমন আমি এখানে বললাম যে উদাহরণ হিসেবে একটা স্যাম্পল সাইজ নিয়ে মানে একটা রেজাল্ট নিয়ে আমি শুরু করে দিলাম ইনিশিয়াল ইনিশিয়াল নিয়ে সেটা হতে পারে একটা টেস্ট কেস বাট ইন জেনারেল আমরা হচ্ছে অনেকগুলো ইন্টারেকশন নিই ঠিক আছে এবং তাদের কিন্তু আমরা যখন ইন্টারেক্ট করছি তখন সেটার কিছু ওয়েইং প্যারামিটারও কিন্তু থাকে যেমন আমি আমি হচ্ছে বেশ কিছু জিনিস এখানে স্কিপ করেছি সময়ের সাথে যে প্রত্যেকটা ডকিং পোজ কামস উইথ আ স্কোর কেমন কনফিডেন্সিয়াল কনফিডেন্স স্কোর সহকারে আসে কিন্তু যে এটা কতটা রিলায়েবল ইন টার্মস অফ এনার্জেটিক্স এবং আমরা কিন্তু এখানে জিনিসটাকে ছেড়ে দিচ্ছি না যে আমরা কিন্তু বলে দিচ্ছি না যে এখানেই এভাবেই ওর ইন্টারেকশন হবে আমরা ইন্টারেকশনটাকে টেস্ট করছি মলিকুলার ডিনামিক্স এর মাধ্যমে সো আনসারটা হচ্ছে এই যে এটা অ্যাড্রেস করা হয় বড় স্যাম্পল সাইজ ইউজ করার মাধ্যমে হয়তো দশটার বদলে আমরা একশোটা নিয়ে হয়তো টেস্ট করব এবং প্রত্যেকটা হবে কি এনার্জেটিক্যাল এনার্জেটিকলি ফেভারেবল পোজ তার মানে হচ্ছে যতগুলো পোজ সম্ভব পোজ আসলে অনেক সম্ভব হাজার দশ হাজার সম্ভব বাট ইন টার্মস অফ কম্পিউটেশনাল রিসোর্স উই হ্যাভ টু ইউজ টেন টু হান্ড্রেড ঠিক আছে এবং তাদের স্ট্যাবিলিটিটা খুবই রিগুলারলি টেস্ট করা হয় সাধারণত ইন জেনারেল রুল অফ থাম হচ্ছে হান্ড্রেড ন্যানো সেকেন্ড বা এরকম করা অন্যান্য সিস্টেমের ক্ষেত্রে কম বেশি হতে পারে বাট এটার আসলে ক্যাপাবিলিটিটা দিনে দিনে বাড়ছে এবং বর্তমানে এক থেকে দুই মাইক্রো সেকেন্ড পর্যন্ত করা হয় সাধারণত ততক্ষণ পর্যন্ত করা হয় যতক্ষণ পর্যন্ত করলে আমরা এটার কেমিক্যাল এবং বায়োফিজিক্যাল বিহেভিয়ার সম্পর্কে জানতে পারি আর কি প্রত্যেকটা স্ট্রাকচারের সাথেই একটা অ্যাসোসিয়েটেড টাইম স্কেল থাকে যে এটার স্টেবল স্ট্রাকচারে আসতে কতটুকু সময় লাগতে পারে তো সেভাবেই আর কি করা হয় এবং এই ব্যাপারটা যখন আমরা ভ্যালিডেট করে ফেলতে পারি এনার্জেটিকলি তখন কিন্তু শুরুতেই এটা মানে রিস্ক ফ্যাক্টরটা রিস্ক রিস্কের কথাটা যখন আসলো এবং এটা যেহেতু ড্রাগ ডেভেলপমেন্টের সাথে রিলেটেড সো এটা শুরুতেই কিন্তু মানে এফ ডি অ্যাপ্রুভ করে দিবে না শুরুতে যেটা হবে সেটা ইনভিট্রোতে যাবে ইনভিট্রো এক্সাম্পলে যাবে ইনভিট্রো টেস্টে যাবে সেখানেও হচ্ছে একটা রিগোরাস স্টেপের মধ্যে দিয়ে যাবে যে এই এই টাইপের অফ এই টাইপের ইন্টারেকশন আসলেই ব্রেইনে ঘটে কিনা আমরা যে কম্পিউটেশনাল সিমুলেশনে দেখলাম সেটা আমরা একটা ইনভিট্রো সিস্টেমে সিমুলেট করতে পারি কিনা সেটা দেখা হবে তারপর যখন ইনভিট্রোতে হবে তখন তারা ইনভিভো টেস্টে যাবে 
ঠিক আছে ইন ভিভো টেস্টে মানে হচ্ছে একেবারেই ফিজিক্যাল যে এক্সপেরিমেন্ট সেটার মধ্যে যাবে ফিজিক্যাল এক্সপেরিমেন্ট বলতে হয়তো বা শুরুতে অ্যানিম্যাল মডেলের উপরে তারা এটা টেস্ট করে দেখবে সেখানেও যদি তারা দেখে যে এখানে আমরা একই রকম রেজাল্ট পাচ্ছি তখন তারা যাবে হচ্ছে ক্লিনিক্যাল টেস্টে অর্থাৎ তারা হচ্ছে তখন এটাকে ড্রাগ আকারেই একটা প্রোটোটাইপ ডেভেলপ করবে এবং সেটাকে ছোট স্কেলে মানুষের উপর অ্যাপ্লাই করে দেখবে যে এই ধরনের ইন্টারেকশনই আসলে পাচ্ছে কিনা এবং তারপর সেটাতেও যদি একই রকম রেজাল্ট পাওয়া যায় তখন সে অ্যাপ্রুভাল হবে সো দেয়ার আর সো মেনি চেক মার্কস হিয়ার দ্যার ইউ হ্যাভ টু পাস থ্রু কাজেই রিস্কের যে ব্যাপারটা এটা অ্যাকচুয়ালি ভেরি ফার্স্ট স্টেজ অফ মলিকুলার ডকিং এই আসলে শুড বি টেকেন কেয়ার অফ বাট তারপরেও হচ্ছে প্রত্যেকটা স্টেজেই কিন্তু এই জিনিসগুলো ভেরিফাই করে যেতে হবে যে এনার্জেটিকলি ফেভারেবল কি না এবং আমরা কোন রকম আনফেভারেবল পোজ বা আনফেভারেবল ইন্টারেকশন নিয়ে পাস করে যাওয়াটা আসলে ভেরি আনলাইকলি আনসারটা কি পাওয়া গেল Great. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to take a couple of more questions, I guess. Uh, the time was up to 12, right? Amra, I'll act a little bit of a question. If anyone wants to ask away. Dada, I'm going to ask you a question. 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 Yeah, so I have a quick question. So you are using the dynamic simulation for the end of materials. My question is, are you using all of this model or uh, a kind of uh, screen molecular dynamics? Uh, I didn't get that. It's like... Uh... The, the, you are breaking off. Could you... Oh, sorry. So my connection is very... Uh, maybe I can just type in and uh, you can... Uh, uh, that would be, that'd just... be convenient, I guess. Okay, so I'm typing in the time, by the time you can also ask. You know. If anyone else wants to ask any more questions, please go ahead or type in. Um, I want to, like... Um, আমার আমার রিসার্চ যদিও কমপ্লিটলি ডিফারেন্ট ফিল্ড সো ইট মাই বি আইভ কোয়েশ্চেন বাট আই ওয়ান্ট টু নো সো দিস দ্য মডেলিং ইউ ডুইং রাইট নাও ডাজ ইট স্টার্ট ফ্রম কন্টিনিউম লেভেল এন্ড দেন গোস টু এথোমিক এথোমিক স্কেল ওর ইজ দ্য আদার ওয়ে রাউন্ড ইটস দি আদার ওয়ে রাউন্ড আমি একটা সময় বললাম না যে এটা আসলে বটম আপ অ্যাপ্রোচ কাইন্ড অফ থিং Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, you can search for one term. It's called atomistic based continuum modeling. So okay. you start at the very bottom, uh, like sub-exon, sub-exonal level modeling. And uh, then you get the mechanical properties of those sub-exonal components. And then you can apply those properties to a kind of bigger model, like whole exon, which contains all of these. Now, when you keep scaling up like this, uh you get a very uh, big model with so much details because uh if you start at the uh, like uh, continuum scale what happens is that uh you just make a head model with uh, pro- possibly a million uh, million elements let's say i'm like a brain air fem model nilam সেটা সেটাকে আমরা এটা করা যেতেই যেতেই পারে আমাদের হচ্ছে এমআরআই ইমেজ অনেকগুলো নিলাম সেটাকে স্ট্যাক করে একটা থ্রিডি মডেলে আমরা রূপান্তর করলাম সেটা সেটাকে আমরা মেশ মেশে কনভার্ট করে আমরা এফিএম মডেলিং শুরু করলাম কিন্তু এটাতে প্রবলেম হবে কি যে এটা আসলে ছোট কম্পোনেন্ট গুলোর যে মেকানিক্যাল সাপোর্টটা দিচ্ছে সেটা এখানে ক্যাপচার করবে না এফিএম মডেল গুলোর একটা বড় ইয়ে হচ্ছে কি লিমিটেশন হচ্ছে কি যে এখানে দেখা যায় যে শুধুমাত্র দুইটা কি তিনটা মেজর কম্পোনেন্টের প্রপার্টি ইউজ করা হয় জাস্ট স্কাল আর ব্রেইনের জন্য একটা হোমোজেনাইজড একটা প্রপার্টি দ্যাট সর্ট অফ থিংস এরকম একটা একটা কি দুইটা প্রপার্টি এখানে কিন্তু মানে একজোনাল লেভেলের যেই প্রপার্টিগুলো সেগুলো ক্যাপচার করা হচ্ছে না যার কারণে এটা ম্যাক্রো স্কেলে হয়তো বা ঠিক কিন্তু রিয়েলিস্টিকলি ন্যানোস্কেল ইঞ্জুরি ক্যাপচার করার জন্য এটা যথেষ্ট না 
এখন কথা হচ্ছে বটম আপেরও আবার কিছু অসুবিধা আছে সেটা হচ্ছে কনস্টেন্ট কনস্টেন্টটা কি রকম যে একটা ব্রেইনের মডেল আমরা এফিএম এ করলে সেটা এক মিলিয়ন এলিমেন্ট দিয়ে করে ফেলতেই পারছি কিন্তু যখন আমরা হচ্ছে বটম আপ করছি তখন বিশ বিলিয়ন নিউরন সেটার প্রত্যেকটার একজন সেটার প্রত্যেকটা সাব একজনাল কম্পোনেন্টের প্রপার্টি আমরা ইনকর্পোরেট করতে গেলে এটা যে মডেলটা হবে সেটা হবে আপ টু দিস ডেট এটা হচ্ছে ইম্পসিবল মানে এটা এতই মাঝখানে একটা পয়েন্টে এসে মিলতে হয় এবং হচ্ছে একটা স্কেলিং ল অ্যাপ্লাই করে দুইটার মধ্যে কানেকশন ক্রিয়েট করতে হয় so far that's my understanding je ei type er problem gulo kibhabe address korte hobe are you using pgmd or all atom md model acha shottojit er question bodhay eta ekhane hocche ojigesh korteche je all atom md model ke ami use kortechi naki coarse grain atomic model use kortechi amar phd work e ami jeta amar jeta address kora legechilo seta hocche je tau protein er mechanical property neurofilament er mechanical property ebong microfilament er mechanical property eta amader khetre jeta amra korechilam seta hocche all atom model i chilo kintu ekhane ami ekta jinish add korte chai seta hocche jokhon microtubule er sathe tau protein er interaction amar dekha legechilo tokhon system ta hocche too big কেমন কারণ হচ্ছে সেটা আমরা যদি একটা ওয়াটার দিয়ে সলভেট করতে চাই সিস্টেমটাকে এটা হচ্ছে মিলিয়ন অফ অ্যাটমস এক্সিড করে যাচ্ছে এবং মোস্ট অফ দা মোস্ট অফ দা কম্পিউটেশনাল সুপার কম্পিউটার অ্যাক্সেস করে আমরা যেগুলো করতাম সেগুলো অনেক ক্ষেত্রে এটা অনেক চ্যালেঞ্জিং সেক্ষেত্রে আমরা কিছু কিছু ক্ষেত্রে যেটা করেছিলাম সেটা হচ্ছে ইমপ্লিসিট সলভেশন ইউজ করেছিলাম মানে অল অ্যাটম সিস্টেম বাট ইউ আর ক্রিয়েটিং অ্যান এনভারনমেন্ট সো দ্যাট as if the system is submerged uh, in a in a continuum solution uh, solution environment thik ache ekon question hocche jodi amra arek to scale up kortam tokhon kintu hocche all atom simulation all atom simulation e thaka jeto na tokhon amader coarse grain modeling e ashole jete hoto so eta hocche ekta ami bolbo je reasonable compensation je system ta jokhon amader mane sub exonal component e thake individual sub exonal component tau protein ba microtubule erokom tokhon amra all atom molecular dynamic simulation korte pari ekhon porjonto kintu tar chhe jokhon step up korbo scale up korbo mane dhora jak je exon exon network a bundle of exons tokhon ki ar all atom e thaka somvabe hobe na karon hocche tokhon seta 10 15 million atom ba tar chheo beshi hoye jabe তখন আমাদের আসলে কোর্স ড্রেনিং করতে হবে এটা হচ্ছে কথা মানে অ্যাটমের সংখ্যাটা কমানোর জন্য If anyone else wants to ask any questions or follow up, uh, I, can, I think you can definitely reach out to Richard Pai. Um, he's available, I guess, through LinkedIn or whatever, uh, or email address that would be more convenient. Sure. Uh, uh, you are available to be available? I think so. Uh, whoever was recording, you uh, can record successful Chilo. Was there any problem? if anyone could unmute and protoy uh, can you hear me acha i tomar i guess bangladesh theke ki network e samoshar karone amra clear shunte pacchi na but hopefully as far as i know ora hocche screen record korte chilo zoom er ফেসবুক পেজ 